Our Lady of Chivalry, excerpts taken from The Life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the history of the devotion to her, translated from the French of the Abbe Orsini by Mrs. J. Sadler. The Barbarious Times The invasion of the barbarians was, for religion, as for the nations which live and venerated and civilize under the shadow of the Roman eagles, a period of mourning, of terror, and of tears, a night of blood, illumined by the distant glare of the conflagrations, resounding with the clash of arms, and crossed by warlike chiefs who took to themselves the fearful title of Scourges of God. When the sound of this great passage of men had ceased, and it became possible to distinguish objects through the smoke of conflagrations and the dust of battlefields, it was found that Europe had changed its face. The Saxons occupied fertile England, the Franks had taken possession of Gaul, the Goths of Spain, and the Lombards of Italy. There remained not a single vestige of the sciences, the arts, or the institutions of the mighty people of Romulus. Barbarism had invaded all and swept away all before it. New forms of government, new laws, new customs were everywhere observed. One thing only had resisted the general transformation, Christianity, which was to console the conquered and humanize the conquerors. The devotion to Mary, impeded for a while by Arianism, which was fatally predominant for some time after the invasion of the Goths and Vandals, flourished again under the victorious banners of the Franks. Clovis, the only Catholic king of his time, conceived the design of the building at the eastern extremity of the city under the invocation of Our Lady, a metropolitan church of which he himself laid the first stone, and which was completed by his son, Childebert. This church, built on the site of an ancient Druid temple, was adorned with marbled columns, frescoes on a golden ground, and a mosaic pavement. The poet bishop Fortunatus gives special praise to its windows, which filled the interior with a flood of light. These windows were a luxury imported from Greece and Italy, and were then first introduced into the Gauls. But of all the pious foundations in honor of the Blessed Virgin which date from these remote times, there is none more worthy of note than that of Our Lady of Treves, in that ancient county of Trongs, the fatherland of the Franks, which then made part of the Duchy of Austria. Who does not remember the popular legend of Genevieve of Brabant, that moving tale sung by so many troubadours and minstrels in the baronial halls of the feudal times, and told by the cottage hearth for a thousand years and more, this story of the barbarous ages, attested by a monument, commemorates a most tragical event, a true drama from which Shakespeare perhaps drew, for he loved to draw from ancient chronicles, the two most powerful characters that his fancy ever produced, Iago, the traitor and calumniator, and Othello, the hero with the credulous mind and jealous heart. Siegfried, Palatine of Treves, reluctantly tears himself from the arms of a beloved wife to go fight the Moors under the glorious manner of Charles Martel. Golo, the master of the prince's household, to whom he had confided the care of his young wife, a model of virtue and a pearl of beauty, conceived a shameful passion for the princess, and was not slow in declaring it. Repulsed with the contempt which his treason merited, the unworthy favorite, who had deliberately planned his lord's disgrace, hesitated not to calumniate the woman whom he could not seduce. For all vices are sisters. Siegfried believed him. He was far away from home. He loved his wife madly and was jealous. In the first burst of what he considers his just indignation, he condemned Genevieve to die, together with her child. But the servants charged to execute this fatal sentence in the depth of a dark forest had not the heart to do it, and the Belgian princess was left with her newborn infant in that gloomy forest, peopled only with wild beasts. The child was suckled by a wild doe. For six long years did the innocent and injured wife live on roots and wild fruits, constantly begging of God that her innocence might be recognized. The compassionate virgin, touched by so many tears and so much misery, came to her one day as she sat by a spring and promised her that her wishes should be accomplished. Soon after, Siegfried, who still loved his wife and was inconsolable for her loss, being on a hunting party, found Genevieve in a cave, covered with rags, her long hair hanging over her shoulders like a veil. 
Golo confessed his crime and was torn asunder by four wild bulls from the Black Forest. This act of stern justice being done, Genevieve had a church built in honor of Mary amid the woods where she had so long wandered, and on the very spot where the Mother of God had appeared to her. Hydophilus, Archbishop of Treves, consecrated this church in the year 746. Gaul was not entirely converted to the gospel. Under the Merovingian kings, the Franks had completely abjured their fierce German deities, but there were still some vestiges of polytheism amongst the Romans of the cities, who continued to draw omens from the flight and singing of birds, to feast on Thursday in honor of Jupiter, to swear by Neptune, Pluto, Diana, or the Geni. In fine, who dared to light lamps and hang up offerings in the deserted temples of the idols, for which St. Eloy reproaches them in his homilies. These frail shoots of Greek and Roman idolatry soon withered of themselves on an adverse soil, but the religion of the Celts stoutly resisted the sacerdotal acts, and it was ages before it died away. So late as the fourth century the image of the goddess Berecynthia, representing cultivated ground, was born through the fields. In the fifth it is decreed by a canon of the second council of Arles that if a baron permits lamps to be lit before trees, rocks, or fountains, he shall be cut off from the communion of the faithful, after being first admonished and solemnly warned. At the end of the sixth century, the council of Auxir forbids vows being made to bushes, trees, or fountains. In the council of Nantes, the date of which is fixed by Flodard at the year 658, the bishops are advised to uproot the trees which the Britons still persist in worshipping, and from which they would not, on any account, cut a single branch. The priest Paulinius represents these same Gauls as having relapsed into their former idolatry, placing meats on the sacred stones at the foot of the trees, and beseeching a venerable oak, which was probably the sepulcher of some old chief druid, with the humble fernal offerings of a handful of beech nuts, to protect their wives, their children, their servants, and their houses. The bishops of Charlemagne's time likewise pronounced severe penalties against these superstitions, which had outlived the Merovingian dynasty, and they must have been still of some account when the church passed laws against them, so late as the opening years of the ninth century. It was especially in the two Amoricas, east and west, where the gospel was late sown and of slow growth, that the native worship, favored by force as old of the world itself, long held its ground despite of councils and bishops, who, nevertheless, strained every nerve to root it out. The deserts of Sisi in the Contantine Peninsula was peopled, even in the seventh century, by pagan Gauls, who lived there, as we learn from the canons of some of the councils of those times, positively like wild beasts. But if idolatry was obstinately sustained by the scalds and bards and some druids wandering in the woods, the zealous Christians had the ardor which secures victory, and proved it well. In the depth of these remote solitudes, said to be the haunts of demons, where strange things were indeed revealed, when the torches of the Gauls, who repaired by night to some forbidden rite, flashed in the foliage of the mighty oaks, or formed a fiery circle around some dark dolmen planted on the moonlight heath. Hermits, often of high birth, took up their dwellings in clay huts, covered with brambles, some hidden by a coat of mingled moss and ivy. Their beds were of dry leaves, sometimes the bark of trees. Their food consisted of fruits, berries, and wild roots. Their garments, a toga, or gown of white, coarse wool. Making their way through the tall, tangled ferns of those primeval forests, whose secret ways they knew not, these good shepherds sought out in every direction the stray sheep of Christ. When the good odor of the sanctity of one of these solitaries spread abroad through the old Neustrian woods, other hermits hastened to place themselves under his guidance. Then they set about clearing the hard, dry earth, choked up for ages with briars and brambles. Then the yellow crops began to wave on the fair hillside. Then, at the calm evening hour, when the birds sat warbling on the trees, the hymns of Sodilius, in honor of the Virgin Mary, arose in grave, sweet tones from the very places where the victims doomed to die under the stone knife of the sacrifices to appease the Gaelic gods had of old chanted his death song. Women, 
ever ready, notwithstanding her natural timidity, to brave all dangers when occasion requires, women would fain contribute her share to the overthrow of paganism, and bravely advance to attack it, even in its ancient strongholds under the protection of Mary. St. Fremond, a nobleman who had grown disgusted with the world, and who was forced to receive the episcopal crown in his humble cell, founded a monastery of nuns in his beloved solitude. And this convent is one of the first of Neustrian Amorica, of which there is any record. The holy bishop added to it a handsome church which he dedicated to the mother of God. This monastery, built about the year 674, was destroyed by the idolatrous Romans, but was rebuilt with increased splendor by their Christian descendants. Christianity, which according to old Spanish tradition, was brought into Spain by St. James, four years after the death of our Lord, made rapid progress in that country, and flourished there, mixed up, it is true, with the terrors of Arianism from the invasion of the Goths and Vandals. The veneration of Mary was already common, though somewhat eclipsed by that of St. Vincent, the great martyr of Caesar Augusta, now Saragossa, whom Prudentius had celebrated in his hymns. Our Lady of the Pillar, which was at first, it seems, but a poor chapel, built of clay and round stones, was already a Roman church, frequented by numerous pilgrims, where the statue of the Blessed Virgin seemed to smile on the kneeling Spaniards from the height of her rich marble column. Our Lady of Toledo, the Metropolitan Church of Spain, the foundation of which is referred by some Spanish historians to the first ages of Christianity, was authentically consecrated in the year 630 under the Gothic king Recarado, the first king of Spain who merited the title of Catholic, since he expelled the Arians from his kingdom after having their errors condemned by a council held in Toledo. But the shrine of Mary most frequented by the Spanish people in those remote ages to which we now refer was that of Our Lady of Covadunga, in the Austrias. The reason was that, under the natural arches of this Austrian cave, consecrated to Mary by the ancient hermits when they were waging war against Druidism, in the depths of that Spanish forest where it long maintained itself, the flag of independence, the sacred banner of the cross, had taken refuge as a last resource after the Battle of Xerix, which delivered Spain to the caliphs. Abandoning forest after forest, mountain after mountain, and retiring with heroic slowness to Mount Atiba, which commands a view of the Cantabrian Sea, the last boundary of Spain, Pelego, a young man of the royal blood, the only hope of his country, found shelter for a short time with a handful of brave followers in this inaccessible cavern, which the piety of the Austrian mountaineers had consecrated to the Blessed Virgin, whose sweet image was placed on a rock that served for an altar. On entering this rude temple, the Spanish hero conceived all sort of hopes, and, kneeling with his companions before the sacred image, he solemnly placed himself and the shattered fortunes of Spain under the protection of Our Lady of Covadunga, took the Virgin's name for his war cry, and fortified himself on her mountain. The mother of God graciously heard the Gothic prince and was pleased to manifest her protection by giving the Spaniards a great victory over the Moors commanded by the Mussulman governor, Alcama. Attributing this unhoped-for victory to the Blessed Virgin, Pelego, to show his gratitude, founded near the natural grotto, which was in the side of a steep rock, at whose base flowed the Asuba, a fair church with the title of Our Lady of Covadunga of the cave, where all Spain went to pray. The descendants of Clovis, the handsome, as he is styled in the introduction to the Salic law, had sadly degenerated from the valor and prudence of that prince. The lamp of the Merovingians, almost consumed, was wasting away without emitting a single flash of light. The sluggish kings, who were no more than empty shows, were scarcely seen by the people more than once a year and then they appeared seated on a chariot bedecked with flowers and green branches, drawn by four oxen who moved with a slow and heavy gait towards the Champ de May, there to exhibit to the public gaze those phantoms of princes whom the breath of Charles Martel could destroy if it deigned to do so. Yet they were pious and built monasteries. 
but piety alone will not suffice to sustain a scepter. That of France is heavy and requires a strong arm, a fearless heart, a clear head, and a prudent mind. The mayors of the palace had all that, happily for Christian Europe, which was soon to be confronted with Islamicism. The Moors, being masters of Spain, had looked with a longing eye from the top of the Pyrenees over the land of France, the fairest kingdom of the West. It seemed to them good to introduce Islamism there, and to change its churches into mosques. The project was no sooner conceived than executed. The rich plains of the south were quickly covered with a numerous army, which pillaged the shrines as it passed along, and dashed from their ancient pedestals the statues of the Virgin and the Saints, contemptuously treating them as idols. All France quaked with fear, from the Pyrenees to the Rhine. The churches could scarcely contain the multitudes who came to implore the assistance of God and the Blessed Virgin. The bishops took up arms. The mitred abbots marched to battle under the flag of their abbey. The abbot of St. Denis hoisted the Oriflamme, which was then peculiar to his own convent. Aquitaine displayed the image of St. Martel and Charles Martel, the cloak of St. Martin of Tours, which was then the royal standard of France. It was truly a holy war, and we consequently see that those who fell in this contest were numbered amongst the martyrs. The battle wherein the Moorish scimitar and the Frankish battle-axe were to decide the destinies of the world, and secure the triumph either of the Koran or the Gospel, was fought on the plains. The two armies viewed each other at first with equal surprise. The French could not help admiring the brilliant eastern cavalry, proud of so many victories, and laden with the spoils of Africa and Asia. The ground shook beneath the fiery tread of their Arab corsairs as they impatiently pawed and pranced, seeming as though they would cry, Forward! Like their type immortalized in the sublime descriptions of Job, the eye was dazzled by the gorgeous flowing robes of the Saracens, the splendor of their jeweled turbans, and the meteor glare of their breastplates and scimitars. The army of the Franks, ranged in angular form for the battle, presented to the sons of Ishmael a sight no less strange or imposing. Those agile warriors, clothed in short garments and exceeding the swiftest horses in the celebrity of their movements, that formidable infantry, which united in its maneuvers the ancient tactics of the Roman legions and the wild ferocity of the Germanic races, that bristling triangle of spears and axes, advancing eagerly but steadily to pierce the Moor squadrons, struck the Arabs with surprise, and soon convinced them, say the ancient chronicles, that they had no longer to deal with the degenerate Goths, and that Charles was a different person from Rodriguez. The Battle of Xerxes, which delivered Spain to the Moors, had lasted eight whole days. The Battle of Tours, which delivered France from them, lasted but a single day. The Arabs charged the Christian army several times, pouring in one battalion after another, like the overwhelming billows of the ocean, but their insatiate fury broke in vain against the solid phalanx of the Franks, whom a Portuguese bishop, Isidore, their contemporary, compares to a wall of ice, against which the Arab host dashed itself to pieces. At length the ferocious Abdurmaima, lieutenant of the Caliph of Baghdad, whose authority extended even to Spain, fell under the crushing axe of Charles. The shades of night separated the combatants, and the next day, when the Christian troops rushed on the African camp in order to complete the ruin of their enemies, they found it empty. The Moors had fled. Then each of the victorious battalions, as they marched into the grateful city, was greeted with the merry sound of bells and the music of joyful anthems, and the whole city resounded with the cry of, Praises be to Christ, who loves the Franks, protects their armies, and watches over their kingdom. Charlemagne, or Carl the Great, as he is styled in the old Frankish chronicles, rejected not the religious inheritance of his father's piety. There is on record one of his pious visits to Our Lady of Morales in Anjou, a pilgrimage which dates, it is said, from the fourth century, and which was then one of the most popular of the Christian world. During his stay in Italy, his rich gifts to St. Mary Major dazzled the Roman people, accustomed as they were to splendor and magnificence. Germany was enriched by him with three churches bearing Our Lady's name, nor was this all. 
The court of Charlemagne imitated him in his tender and profound devotion to the Blessed Virgin. When he declared war against the Muslim king of Cordova, and summoned the lords of southern France to fight under the victorious banners whereon was emblazoned the figure of the archangel Michael, the great patron of the French of that time, the famous paladin Roland, his nephew, before crossing the Pyrenees, which were to be so fatal to him, made a pilgrimage in company with many high and mighty lords to Our Lady of Rocamador. The Carol Vin Yen prince, after having piously invoked Mary, offered her the weight of his brachmor, or sword, of silver, and consecrated to her that sword which had already acquired so much renown. As he was returning to France, covered with glory, the vanguard of the French army, commanded by him, was surrounded and attacked on all sides in the valley of ron Sevan. In vain did the French brave the danger with unflinching courage. They were cut to pieces. Not one would surrender. All perished, both chiefs and soldiers. To perpetuate the memory of this disastrous event, there was erected on the spot, over the collected bones of those chivalrous warriors, a chapel dedicated to Mary, in which was placed an inscription bearing the names of Terry of Ardennes, Rose de Moss, Guy of Bunyon, Oger the Dane, Oliver, and Roland. The chapel situated near the abbey of Roncevaux was adorned with frescoes representing a combat, and for six centuries none but Frenchmen were buried there. The last thought of the paladin Roland, ere as he expired on the field of battle, was an act of respect towards the Blessed Virgin. He desired that his sword might be borne to Our Lady of Rocamador, and it was done as he had commanded. Louis the Pious, or the Good, son of Charlemagne, always wore the image of Mary about his person, whether in the chase or in a journey. When, straying a little from his court, he found himself alone in the woods, he hastily unfastened his gauntlets studded with golden nails, and, drawing from his bosom the venerated image, he placed it at the foot of an oak and knelt to offer up a prayer. He afterwards deposited in the superb abbey of Hill des Heim, where he founded in honor of the Blessed Virgin, and where he planted a rose bush with his own hand, which lasted nearly as long as his noble monastery. Under Charles the Fat, a craven and deceitful monarch, whose disturbed and unhappy reign prepared the fall of the race of Charlemagne, the Normans conducted by Siegfroy came to lay siege to Paris. Siegfroy at first demanded permission for the troops whom he was leading to Burgundy to enter Paris as they passed. The Parisians refused to open their gates to him, and the Normans swore that his sword should break them open. Eudes, son of Robert the Strong, shut himself up in Paris, and resolved to defend it against these barbarians, who, not content with pillaging the houses and churches, robbed even the venerated bodies of the saints. The siege was long and bloody. Seven hundred Norman barks blockaded the Seine. Battering rams, ballistas, and catapults were employed on both sides, and either party darted against the other fiery arrows and burning brands. The Norman towers were placed over against the towers of the besieged ramparts, and the enemy approached the walls under the covered galleries which the Parisians often succeeded in burning, or crushing beneath the weight of beams and stones. From the very beginning of this desperate and heroic conflict, Paris had placed itself under the special protection of the Blessed Virgin. It was her statue that the clergy bore in procession around the ramparts during the siege, and many a Norman arrow was aimed at it in vain. It was Mary whom the archers invoked aloud as they hurled stones and other missiles from the heights of the towers. It was in her honor that, as often as they repulsed the northern pirates, the city was splendidly illuminated with white wax tapers. It is she who saves us, said Abon. It is she who deigns to support us. It is by her help that we still enjoy life. Amiable Mother of our Savior, bright Queen of Heaven, it is thou who has vouchsafed to shield us from the threatening sword of the Danes. Some years after the Blessed Virgin, assisted by a miracle in recovering the city of Nantes from the Normans and expelling them from Bretagne, which they had invaded, Elaine, afterwards surnamed Babatort, or Twisted Beard, 
who had taken refuge in England with the flower of the young Briton nobility, then undertook to regain his country. He was but twenty years old, an exile, and had little else than his sword and the protection of Mary. But a sword is something in the hands of a brave man, and Mary's protection is worth whole squadrons. He landed with some Britons at Concale, and, from stage to stage, tracking his way with Norman corpses, the Breton hero, at length, arrived under the walls of Nantes, where the plundering Northmen had taken refuge as a last resource. Repulsed with loss by the Normans, who had collected numerous bands around the city, Alain, driven to the extremity of the mountain with his troops, stretched himself on the ground. Grievously tried, says an old Briton chronicle, and tormented with thirst, he thereupon began to moan piteously, and with humble supplications to implore the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of our Lord, beseeching her to open a fountain of water, so that he and his exhausted knights might quench their grievous thirst. Which, prayers being heard by the Virgin Mary, she did graciously open a fountain, which is still called St. Mary's Fountain, from which he and his did drink, and being sufficiently strengthened and refreshed, did marvelously recover their vigor, and returned as valiant as ever to the battle. Falling again on the Normans, they slew them and cut them to pieces, excepting all those who fled with their booty to their ships. Alain found the city of Nantes sacked and burned, all covered with dust and blood. The young liberator had long looked in vain amid the piles of smoldering ruins for the stately church of St. Felix, the roof of which, covered with fine tin, was so clear, says contemporary work, that, when shone upon the sun or moon, it resembled burnished silver. Alas, the roof had disappeared, and the sky was the only covering of the ancient church, whose altars were broken and its tombs laid waste. In order to reach the place where the high altar had been, Alain was obliged to clear away the brayers with his sword. Yet the Te Deum of Victory and the Canticles of Praise to the Virgin were chanted with no less fervor amid the ruins of that temple, and before he arose from his knees the young Breton duke recognized the tutelary support of the Blessed Virgin, promised to dedicate to her that cathedral which now bears the name of Our Lady of Nantes. It was in the reign of Charles the Simple that a whole army of the bold northern pirates who had so long ravaged the western coast of Europe was converted to the faith, though at the expense of the fairest jewel in the Frankish crown. Nustria, a rich and fertile province which they had overrun for nearly a century and had even forced to conform to the savage worship of their gods, was made over to them with the sovereignty of Britannia on condition that Rollo, their chief, whose progress through France had been marked by fire and blood, should become a Christian. The condition was accepted. The Norman pirate married a Carolvinian princess, who lived but a short time, and was thoroughly converted. Strangely enough, the religious element had been always strongest amongst these fierce Northmen, who several times sent presents and tapers to the very abbeys which they had come to pillage when a storm rising at sea in sight of the holy place induced them to believe that the Christian sanctuary was guarded by some celestial power. The first question put by the Duke of Normandy to Franco, Archbishop of Rouen, who was instructing him in the mysteries of Christianity, was to ascertain who were the most renowned saints of France and Nustria. The prelate immediately named Our Lady, and enlarged upon her great power. Well, said the Norman prince after a moment's pause. As she is so powerful, we must do something for her. And he thereupon made a large concession of lands to Our Lady of Bayeux. The city of Rouen had dedicated to Mary its metropolitan church, burned by the Normans of Hastings, and repaired as well as possible some time after. The duke was baptized therein with most of his Danish captains, and set on foot to enlarge and beautify it works which his successors magnificently continued. Our Lady of Evreux, one of the most ancient churches of Normandy, if we believe the annals which relate that St. Taran, first bishop of Evreux, founded it about the year 250, and consecrated it to the worship of the true God under the invocation of the Blessed Virgin, likewise received rich gifts from Rollo, who gave, even to his last moments, 
the most signal marks of sincere devotion towards Madame Saint Marie, as she was respectfully called by the princes and nobles of that period. These Norman dukes, by nature happy, generous, and brave, were in general very devout to the Virgin. It was before her altar that they were invested with the regalia of that fair duchy which they proudly styled their kingdom of Normandy. And there it was, too, that they slept their last sleep, under the grey flags of her chapel, hung with tapestry of silk and gold, representing the principal events in the life of the Mother of God, and wrought by the Duchesses of Normandy. Robert the Magnificent had himself no less than three churches built in honor of Mary, and bearing her name, Our Lady of Deliverance, to accomplish a vow made during a storm whilst his bark was tossed about in the dangerous waters of the Norman Archipelagio, Our Lady of Grace, near Honfleur, and finally Our Lady of Pity, under the Ducal Castle which defended Honfleur. This prince, so devoted to Mary, resolved on going to Jerusalem to visit her tomb at the Holy Sepulchre. He set out on horseback, accompanied by the richest and noblest lords of his court, all radiant with gold, sparkling with jewels, and surrounded by a crowd of valets, squires, and pages, as though they were going to some great tournament. As they passed along, the people came forth in crowds to see them, and their entry into Rome was something remarkable. The Romans regarded with admiration these northern barbarians who made even Italy itself tremble, and whose tall stature and noble mind reminded them of their ancient heroes. Seeing their lordly bearing, their brilliant armor, their long gold-hilted swords, and their pointed helmets, whence their fair tresses escaped, they asked each other who were these princes from the north who came thus as humble pilgrims to visit the tombs of the apostles. The Pope gave them a distinguished reception, bestowed on them his pastoral blessing, and with his own hands placed the pilgrim staff on the shoulder of their princely chief. Thence they continued their route to Constantinople, the city of Mary, where they dazzled with their magnificence. They scattered gold and pearls through the streets as they passed along. Robert's mule was shod with gold, and when a nail fell out, not a Norman deigned to stood in search of it. It was for the Greeks to gather from the dust the gold nails lost by the Norman's horse. On approaching the holy place, the Christian spirit made itself felt. Those same travelers, who had crossed or braved, without acknowledging any right or toll, so many well-defended rivers and so many embattled walls, those bold companions, who always took care to let the point of their swords be seen underneath the pilgrim's robe, they, who were so lately proud even to insolence, could now be scarcely recognized. So humble, so modest, so collected were they made by the mere proximity of that holy land, whose arid, rocky soil they trod barefoot. Robert, so justly styled the Magnificent, visited with the most edifying devotion the holy sepulchres of Jesus and Mary. Christians and Muslims alike received from him such munificent alms that the emir of Jerusalem, excited to emulation, refused to accept the tribute due to him by these splendid pilgrims. Robert left a liberal donation at the Holy Sepulchre. Richard II, Duke of Normandy, had already made an offering there of a hundred pounds of gold. The pilgrimage accomplished, the Duke set out by land on his return to his fair duchy, which he was never more to see. He died at Nice in Bethania, jesting on the aspect of death, like the sea kings and his fathers, and commending himself to Madame Saint Marie, as his Christian predecessors had done. The devotion to the Blessed Virgin contributed much to the establishment of the gospel amongst the Scandinavians. From time memorial, they had deified virginity in the person of Fala, whose fair tresses were bound with a golden band, and Jason who, after their death, admitted virgins into her heavenly train. Three virgins, seated under the sacred oak, disposed of the fate of men, and those white ladies were also virgins who gilded over the lakes like a pillar of mist, sat at midnight in the freezing shadow of the pines, and sang with a soft, low voice the runic hymns which the scalds had engraved with the point of their swords on the rocks that overhung the sepulchral mound of the heroes whom the ravens of the air mourned. 
it was hard to set aside those charming northern fairies who introduced themselves invisibly into the peasant's cot and the jarl's fortress, and whose coming was sure to bring good fortune. These superstitions, equally cherished by the high and the low, could never perhaps be totally eradicated without the Blessed Virgin, who became the protectress of cabin and palace. The influence of the Queen of Heaven on the conversion of the Scandinavians is proved by a fact which none can dispute. It is that Christianity owed its success among those nations to the mothers of families who afterwards gained over the warriors. The first Christian kings of Denmark were faithful servants of Mary. St. Canute, Duke of Schleswig, dedicated to her three superb churches. Waldemar II placed her image on his shield, and having learned that the Russians, leagued with the Estonians, threatened the rising of the Church of Riga, he solemnly pledged himself to pass the following year in Estonia, as well as for the honor of the Blessed Virgin, as for the remission of his sins. It was in this war, commenced under the patronage of Mary, that the Danes, surprised in their camp, lost their national banner. As they began to give way before the pagans, the Blessed Virgin, whom they had piously invoked before leaving Estonia, gave them, it is said, a sensible mark of her powerful protection. A red flag with a white cross fell from heaven, according to ancient chronicles, and with that flag victory returned. The devotion to Mary flourished long in the three kingdoms of the north, as is proved by the great number of cathedrals, hermitages, and monasteries which they dedicated to her. When the scorching wind of the Reformation had blighted that fair flower of Catholicity, this devotion was still secretly maintained, and fifty years after Luther, Mary was still venerated in the subterraneous chapel of the Cathedral of Upsal. This consoling devotion ended in those far northern regions as it began in Rome amongst the tombs. It was under the influence of Mary that Prussia and all the coasts of the Baltic Sea received the light of the gospel. Amongst the nations of Slavonic origin, who substituted Christianity for their bloody rites and polished their names under its civilizing influence, no people were so devout to the Virgin as the Hungarians. Towards the beginning of the 11th century, St. Stephen, the first Christian king of the Huns, or Hungarians, founded Our Lady of Abroyal in thanksgiving for a victory obtained over the Prince of Transylvania. This fair Slavonic basilica vied in magnificence with the most sumptuous churches of the East, its walls adorned with superb sculptures, its marble pavements, its altars overlaid with gold and encrusted with fine jewels, its vases of silver, gold, and onyx, were marvelous to behold. Over the virgin's altars were perfuming pans of silver, in which two old men, whose cradles had been rocked to the exploits of Attila, had the rarest perfumes of Asia burned. Processions came several times in the day to honor the Mother of God in her sanctuary. All this splendor was not sufficient for the piety of the Hungarian prince, descended, though he was, from the scourge of God. It was his pleasure to hold his crown in subjection to the Virgin, whom he declared sovereign of his states. Thus, as often as the name of Mary was pronounced throughout the extent of that vast kingdom, there was not a Hungarian noble, no matter how high his lineage, who did not bend the knee and bow down as a vassal before his liege lady. Within the fortified walls of every castle, there was a small chapel lit by several brass or silver lamps, which burned night and day before Mary's image. The prince Palatines even carried the same image to battle and raised an altar for it in their tents. The devotion to Mary was kept up with no less fervor on the banks of Estula. Dating from the day when the Dumbraca, the fair Bohemian princess, converted King Misislaus and made him break the idols which his fathers had raised to Pogoda, calm air, to Pohist, the cloudy sky, and to the gloomy deities of the abyss, the Poles became essentially Catholic and built numberless chapels of larchwood in honor of the Mother of God. Pagan banners, taken on twenty battlefields, were the only ornaments of these primitive churches, nestling amongst the evergreen pines of the Slavonic forests. But when, during the celebration of Mass, 
the ministers of Jesus Christ read the gospel to those northern heroes, kneeling before an altar as poor as the crib of Bethlehem. Every sword was seen half drawn from the scabbard, in token of protection and defense. Nor was this an idle show. Poland was long the bulwark of Christianity. Were it not for John Sobrieski, the crescent would, perchance, have crowned the battlements of the cities beyond the Rhine. Poland was early consecrated to the Blessed Virgin. Mary was solemnly invoked under the title of Queen of Poland, long before John Casimir renewed that consecration. As often as the Polish army moved against the Tartars, it was Mary's banner that led its stately cohorts. The name of Jesus, twice repeated, was their battle cry, and a hymn to the Virgin, their war song. In his last war with France, William the Conqueror delivered Montes to the flames, but that fire which destroyed the church of Our Lady shed such a lurid and terrific light that the king of England's horse took fright, began to rear and prance, and threw his rider, who was mortally wounded. Attributing the fatal accident to the burning of the Virgin's beautiful church, he bequeathed a considerable sum for the purpose of rebuilding it. Being conveyed to an abbey near Rouen, the conqueror of England was roused at the dawn of day on the 7th of September, 1087, by the sound of a matin bell. "'What is that?' he asked, raising his head with difficulty, his face pale and emaciated, though still retaining a portion of that proud, masculine beauty which even the Saxon chroniclers ascribed to him. Being told that it was the bells of St. Mary's Church ringing prime, "'Blessed Lady Mary,' said the Norman hero, raising his hands, "'to thee I commend my soul. Mayest thou reconcile me to thy Son, my Lord Jesus.' And with these words he expired. Henry I, his son, who usurped the crown from Robert, his elder brother, whose eyes he caused to be put out, was devout only in theory. Although he affected much piety and made many splendid foundations in England, where he introduced the Norman architecture, yet he burned several churches in Normandy. For instance, he burned in 1120 the Cathedral of Lisieux with the city itself. The ancient cathedral, which dated from the first ages of Christianity, was dedicated to the Virgin, like most of the Norman cathedrals. The punishment of this sacrilegious offense quickly followed. At the end of the same year, the vessel which carried Henry's only son, Prince William of England, with two of the king's illegitimate children, foundered at sea during a calm moonlight night not far from Barfleur. From that time forward, Henry was never seen to smile. The Empress Matilda, daughter of this prince, had a signal proof of the Virgin's protection and her power over the elements. While at war with Stephen of Blois, she was forced to embark for Normandy in unsettled weather, which very soon became stormy, and was overtaken in the very shoals where her brother William had perished, by one of those frightful tempests which are only seen on the angry ocean. The horizon was sheeted with a vast black cloud which reached from sea to sky like a funeral pall. The mountain billows reared themselves up with ominous slowness to dash with terrific crash against the sides of the royal bark, which they raised high in the air at one moment to hurl it the next into the yawning abyss. The sailors shook their heads despondingly, whilst the English lords, crossing themselves devoutly, recommended themselves to God and the Blessed Virgin and to St. George, the patron of chivalry. Matilda, while standing on the deck, and her composed countenance, though pale, belied not the race of the heroes from which she sprung. Be of good cheer, my lords, she said, turning to her faithful nobles. Our Lady is kind and powerful. She will save us. I will sing her a hymn of thanksgiving as soon as we descry the coast, and I pledge myself to build her an abbey wherever we shall land." Scarcely had the Anglo-Norman princess spoken these words when the waves were seen to grow smooth, the winds were suddenly hushed, and the vessel flew swiftly over a calm sea. A dark speck was soon discerned on the blue sky as the clouds cleared away. It grew larger and larger still. It was a lofty hill whose bare summit was crowned with a hermitage, and a vast forest was seen stretching far and away in the background of the picture. Then was heard the hoarse cry, so impatiently expected from the man at the masthead, 
Contre René, Vici Terre, Sing, O Queen, here is the land. And Matilda instantly began to sing her hymn to the Virgin, which was joyfully repeated by the English barons, which clasped hands and bare heads. The bark, miraculously preserved from shipwreck, soon cast anchor in the little bay of Equerdreville in Lower Normandy. Matilda's first care on landing was to point out the site of her monastery, which she named the Abbey of the Vow, and before quitting the neighborhood, she herself laid the first stone. John Lackland, who died of indigestion in a Saxon abbey, was buried by his own request with great pomp in the beautiful Anglo-Norman Cathedral of Our Lady of Worcester. But if we may believe the ancient chronicles, the body of that base and cruel prince who had steeped his hands in the innocent blood of his lawful king, Arthur of Britannia, and who had a mind to turn Turk in order to conciliate the Moors of Spain, did not long pollute the sacred dwelling of Mary. They relate that strange noises were heard by night in that dishonored tomb, blasphemies, fearful shouts of laughter, revelry, and all manner of terrifying sounds, which caused the monks of Worcester secretly to exhume the body of the reprobate prince and transfer it to some less holy place. The fast of Saturday in honor of the Blessed Virgin was observed by the English people from the time of William Rufus. There was in those days a certain famous robber, a Saxon without doubt, since St. Anselm, the Norman prelate who relates the antidote, calls him a robber without any circumlocution. And he, one morning, entered the cottage of a poor widow with intent to rob her. Finding nothing to his taste, he coolly seated himself on the only spare stool in the little dark room with its earthen floor, where the widow was sitting at her wheel, and addressed her with a winning smile. "'Well, gossip, have you had your breakfast?' "'Is it I, good sir?' replied the poor woman, pausing a moment in her work. "'God forbid! Is it not Saturday? I fast every Saturday throughout the year.' "'Every Saturday?' repeated the astonished robber. "'And why?' "'Why, in honor of the Blessed Virgin, to be sure. Do you not know that there is the reason why she prevents you and others like you from dying unshriven?' "'If that be so,' said the robber, "'I am very glad to know it.' and from henceforth I make a vow to fast myself. He kept his word, and the Blessed Virgin, on her side, did not fail him at the hour of his death. Being mortally wounded on a perilous expedition, she miraculously prolonged his life until he had time to make his peace with God. St. Anselm also informs us that the bold and haughty Norman knights piously honored Mary, whilst oppressing with all their might the conquered Saxons. One of them, a great lord, had had for valets and pages a troop of vagabonds already ready for mischief, and for Stuart an incarnate devil, who constantly persuaded the poor baron now to outrage one, now to plunder another, and again to kill that other, so that not a day passed without some detestable crime. In the midst of all this wickedness, he kept praying devoutly to the Virgin, night and morning, saluting her with seven aves, and as many profound genuflections, for which reason his infernal steward could not strangle him, as he intended, and he finally obtained the grace of a sincere conversion. Spain, no less devout to Mary than the island of Britain, had raised numerous shrines to her, and fought under her standard. In 1212, Alfonso the Ninth having obtained, under the banner of Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, his great victory of Las Navas, where the Moors experienced one of their most signal defeats, built Our Lady of Victory in Toledo, to deposit therein the sacred banner of Mary. St. Ferdinand, that holy prince who could not endure to increase the taxes of his people, and who was more afraid, he said, of the curses of one poor woman than of all the Moorish host, attributed to the protection of the Blessed Virgin his conquests of Cordova, Jaén, and Marreca. Finally, Alfonso the Wise composed canticles to the Mother of God and founded an order of knighthood in her honor. Portugal walked in the same way, with an ardor no less great. In 1142, after having defeated, through the protection of Mary, to whom he had recommended himself before the battle, five Moorish princes— whose five standards he captured on the plains of Alajento, 
Alfonso I founded, in honor of the Blessed Virgin, the superb monastery of Alcobaca, deeming that insufficient, he did homage for his kingdom to Our Lady of Clairvaux, and ordained that every year, at the Feast of the Annunciation, a rent of fifty maravedis of gold should be paid in token vassalage to the Sorazane in the person of the abbots of Clairvaux. One of the successors of this prince, Don Juan I, after a victory, offered to Our Lady of the Olive the weight of himself of silver, and hung the roof of Mary's chapel as ex voto his lance and his brilliant suit of armor. About the same time the kings of Denmark undertook crusades against the pagans of the north, in honor of the Blessed Virgin, and the Poles fought those of Prussia and Pomerania, singing the famous Boga Rorizica, Mother of God, a battle hymn addressed to Mary, composed in the tenth century by St. Adalbert, Bishop of Guzens. The kings of France had no mind to give way to the other princes in devotion to the Queen of Angels. Louis the Young and Philip Augustus, of glorious memory, contributed liberally to the rebuilding of Our Lady of Paris, which Maurice de Sully, a very great bishop of Polybian extraction, was reconstructing on the site of King Childebert's old Merovingian cathedral. Attributing to the Blessed Virgin his splendid victory of Bouvens, Philip Augustus founded on the skirt of the force of Chantilly and on the banks of the deep Oise, the magnificent royal abbey, Goren, bishop of Salins, minister of the king and his companion in arms, who had ably filled the office of adjutant general during the battle, Matthew de Montmorency, who immortalized himself by taking full sixteen of the enemy banners, and Gurand de Conchi and Gurame de Barres, who had formed a rampart along the king that day which the whole Anglo-German army could not force, would all have their share in this commemorative foundation made in reverence to the sacred Virgin Mary, as she had called in the cartularies. King Louis the Ninth, the holiest and most righteous prince that ever wore the crown of France, the best of kings and the model of knights, distinguished himself by his tender devotion to the Blessed Virgin. He contributed to the completion of Our Lady of Paris, and, after having that exquisite gem of art, the Holy Chapel, built by Pierre de Montereau, the most famous architect of his time, as a shrine for the sacred crown of thorns, he solemnly dedicated the lower part of it to Our Lady, whose statue, placed under the porch, wrought a charming miracle one day in behalf of a little girl who was very wise if we may believe the tradition, as the pious child mounted on a stone bench, destined for the use of the poor, stretched herself up on her little feet and reached her arms as high as she could to place a wreath of white roses on the head of the Madonna. The kind virgin graciously bent her fair marble brow towards the little earth angel, wherefore it is, says a monk of the time of Louis the Thirteenth that she has still her head bent forward. St. Louis recited every day with his chaplain the office of the Blessed Virgin, even in his travels, and forbade anyone to interrupt him. He fasted on bread and water on the eve of Our Lady's festivals, and gave great alms on Saturday in her honor. When he thought of undertaking his crusade, he came to Our Lady of Paris, says an ancient chronicle, accompanied by his barons, all barefoot, with scrip and staff, and there heard Mass with great devotion. On his arrival in Egypt, the king found a Muslim army drawn up on the shore to oppose his landing. The air was darkened with the clouds of arrows aimed at the French barks by the Saracens, whose lances gleamed through the cloud of dust raised by their horses like fire behind a dark curtain. Their chief bore arms of fine gold, so dazzling, says Joinsville, in his simple style, that it seemed when the sun struck thereon as though it were actually that star himself. Their standards were surmounted by that ancient golden crescent which had been the emblem of the Turkish kings long before the days of Cyrus, and their war music was terrible to hear and very strange to French ears. But Louis the Ninth and his warriors were not easily frightened. Having come within a short distance of the shore, the holy king, after commending himself to God and the Blessed Virgin, throws himself first into the sea. The foaming waves covers him even to the shoulders. A shower of arrows falls around him. 
neither wave nor dart arrests his course. Buckler on arm, helmet on head, sword in hand, he makes for the Saracens with fiery haste. The whole army hastens after him, and the Africans are quickly routed to the thrilling cries of Mont Joey, Saint Denis. When the Egyptians had disappeared on the wings of fear, the gates of Domitia, the key of the delta, had to open with the crusaders whose first care was to chant the Te Deum of the victory in the Muslim mosque, which was consecrated by the Roman legate under the title of Our Lady of Domitia. The rumor of this glorious event soon reached Syria, where the honor was attributed to the protection of Our Lady of Tortosa, a famous Syrian Madonna, which the Mohammedans themselves came to invoke. She was said to have left her shrine in order to protect the descent of the French crusaders. The disastrous end of the Egyptian crusade, so brilliantly commenced, is but too well known. After paying an enormous ransom, St. Louis turned the prow of his vessels towards Syria. The Christians, who had taken possession of Palestine in 1099, had at that time only a few strong places there, amongst which was Nazareth, the birthplace of Mary, which they had transformed into a feudal fortress, its first French lord being the hero of heroes, Tancred, immortalized in the deathless lay of Teso. St. Louis rebuilt the walls of the Galean fortress, and happening there on the Feast of the Assumption, he had the offices of the day sung with an instrumental accompaniment in the Church of St. Mary, where he solemnly communicated. As King Louis the Ninth was leaving the Holy Land with Queen Margaret, the vessel which bore them was driven by a sudden squall under a lofty promontory which cast its shadow far out to the sea. The tempest having subsided, they cast anchor before that Syrian mountain which was crowned by a monastery, and in the silence of the night, scarce broke by the murmur of the hushed waves, the sound of a distant bell came over the waters with the sweet perfume of thyme from the woods. "'What is that?' demanded the king quickly. He was told by some Phoenician sailors who were on board that it was the convent of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. The holy king went ashore at the first dawn of the day to hear Mass in Mary's monastery, the monks of which, clothed in Arab costume, lived on fruits and vegetables, fasted half the year, kept a rigorous silence, and lived by manual labor." The fervent and cinnabotic spirit of the ancient solitaries still reigned there. Penetrated with the respect for their austere piety, St. Louis brought with him six of these monks, who were named the Brothers of the Order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and established them in Paris on the banks of the Seine. They subsequently removed to the place Maubert, and there the new church, consecrated under the title of Our Lady of Carmelites, was chiefly built by the munificent donations of Joan of Evreux, third wife and widow of Charles II, surnamed the Fair. This princess presented to the Virgin of Mount Carmel her crown of jewels, together with her zone, embroidered with pearls, and the bouquet of golden lilies studded with precious stones, which the king had given her on the day of her coronation. Fifteen hundred gold florins accompanied this royal gift. During the long struggle of the Hundred Years' War between Britain and France, interrupted only by some truces when the combatants paused for breath, their hand on the dirk and their feet in blood, the Blessed Virgin, whose abbeys were often unscrupulously plundered by the English, was still the object of their profound veneration. After having destroyed an entire city and retired loaded with booty, they sometimes left one of her statues perfectly safe on its pedestal and when the inhabitants, finding them gone, ventured to return in search of their ruined dwellings, they crossed themselves devoutly and cried, A miracle! It was indeed a miracle to see such an act of respect amid a scene of frightful devastation. The shrines wherein it had pleased the Queen of Heaven to manifest her power were held as neutral and sacred ground. Each of them was, as it were, an oasis of peace, towards which journeyed knights and soldiers, from every country, who were nothing more than pious pilgrims from the moment they fastened a little image of the Madonna to their steel helmet or serge hood. We read in the manuscript chronicles of Quercy that certain English soldiers, having been arrested by those of Cahors, were restored to liberty with kind and encouraging words as soon as they were found to be pilgrims of Our Lady. 
The feasts of the Blessed Virgin were scrupulously observed by the English troops, who even stopped on their march to celebrate them. In 1380, Buckingham, who made his way through the heart of France, sweeping all before him, halted with his army in the force of Montchener to celebrate the September feast of Our Lady. The English knights heard mass devoutly in an abbey which they found in the woods, and their long Bordeaux blades were innocent of French blood that day. An English captain named Norwick, whom Prince John, Duke of Normandy, an heir presumptive to the throne, had suddenly besieged in an Angolum, whose provisions failed him, skillfully availed himself of that devotion to the Virgin, which was common to both nations, in order to escape the necessity of surrendering at discretion. On the eve of the purification, one of the great festivals of Our Lady, kept in France from the time of Pepin the Short, he goes forth from the walls and demands speech of the prince. The latter, coming forward, asks, Do you come to capitulate? No, replies the Englishman. You and I are both devoted to the Blessed Virgin. I crave, then, of your courtesy, a suspension of hostilities, and that, during the twenty-four hours consecrated to this festival, the soldiers on both sides be forbidden to use their arms on any pretense whatsoever. Be it so, said the prince, I am well content. Next morning, by the earliest dawn, Norwick marches out with the garrison of all of its stores. The French sentries, stopping him, ask what he means by the sally. I mean to profit by this truce, he replies, to let my soldiers take a walk. When Prince John was informed of the fact, he said, I vow to God the stratagem was a good one. Let them go and welcome, since we have the city." Notwithstanding all the testimonies of respect which she received from the invaders, the Blessed Virgin turned from them to protect the invaded. As an oppressed country, France had found favor before her, as was proved by more than one miracle. In Poitiers, the mayor's servant, who had sold the city to the English and promised to admit them on a dark moonless night, could nowhere find the keys which he was astonished to see the next day in the hands of an ancient statue of the Virgin in her own cathedral of Notre Dame. At Rennes, which the Duke of Lancaster had long besieged in vain, the English, despairing of taking the brave city by storm, made a mind in order to blow it up. The Britain city sleeps calmly over a volcano, unconscious of its danger, but Our Lady watches." When the mine had reached the cathedral of St. Mary, and the enemy is about to set fire to it, the tapers in the chapel of Our Lady of St. Saviour are seen to light of themselves in the midst of the dark night. The bells, put in motion by invisible hands, suddenly peal out, and when the inhabitants, awoke from sleep and hastily clothed, come flocking to the strangely lit church, asking, What is the matter? The Virgin slowly extends her stony arm from the side of the Gothic nave and points to the place where the mine is about to explode. The city, warned and timed, was saved. Many other examples might be given showing how Mary protected France during that disastrous period. We shall content ourselves with giving on the authority of contemporary writers worthy of credit the most striking of these numerous prodigies. It was after those two lamentable days which France will never cease to mourn, Crissy, where the flower of the French chivalry fell, and Poitiers, where King John was made prisoner, were eight hundred of his barons by the Black Prince. The nobles were ruined, the young regent without troops, the most fertile fields were overrun with Brerres, the city, threatened with the horrors of a siege by the stranger, who camped at their gates, were internally rent asunder by factions. When man was nothing more to expect on earth, he kneels and raises his suppliant hands to heaven. This is what was done by all good people in town and country in the cities and the villages. They boldly demanded a miracle from God through the intercession of Mary so that these calamities might have an end. Their faith was great and their woes inexpressible. Their prayer was therefore heard. Abusing his power and taking advantage of the utter prostration of France, Edward III, when in treaty with the young regent, afterwards Charles the Wise, proposed conditions so hard, so disgraceful, so intolerable, that France, exhausted as she was, raised her head with generous indignation and said no. At this unexpected refusal, Edward crosses the sea and lays siege to Chartres. 
and the English army pitched their tents a short distance from the walls, and in front of that splendid cathedral, so magnificently rebuilt by Fulbert, with the gifts of the faithful, high and low, plates on the height which commands the city, the fair Gothic church which its lofty spires, which may be seen at a distance of ten leagues, look like a sacred citadel, with the city reposing in its shade. In that sanctuary, so universally revered, there was a reliquary of precious wood, overlaid with thick plates of gold, and encrusted with diamonds, rubies, and pearls. In it was kept one of Mary's precious garments, her wedding robe of Babylonian stuff, flowered with blue, violet, white, and gold. One day the Normans were besieging Chartres, and the inhabitants, well disposed to defend their temple, took their sacred relic for their standard. The Normans, beholding it, instantly fled. It was then customary to touch with this reliquary the doublet of the fine Britain linen worn by the nobles of the day of their receiving knighthood. Richard the Lionhearted, to whom it was brought all the way to England, offered in return to Our Lady of Chartres a rich jewel of golds and precious stones, containing relics of St. Edward. The Madonna of Chartres was, therefore, held in high veneration by the English knights, and, doubtless, there were many of them who secretly blamed the king for exposing to sacrilege and pillage the holy things of Mary's cathedral. The city, summoned by the English king to surrender, simply replied that it would not, and Edward's messengers saw nothing but the massive gate, strongly plated and studded with iron, above which, in a charming Gothic niche, decorated with carved foliage, was a white Madonna with the inscription engraved on stone, Tortella Carnatum. The siege of the ancient capital of the Carnuti was a long duration, and the fertile fields of France were bristling with English swords instead of ears of grains. The Dauphin tried, by negotiation, to save the favorite city of Mary, but Edward was deaf to his offers and representations. The French, envoys, rudely repulsed, had no longer the shadow of a hope, and the city seemed all but lost. When there took place, says Frossart, a miracle which much humbled and broke down the courage of the English king. A thunderbolt, a storm so great and so horrible, descended from heaven on the king of England's army, that it seemed as though the end of the world had indeed come. For there fell from the sky stones so large that they killed both men and horses, and even the boldest were struck with fear. If thou sowest in the garden of life the seeds of wrath, said the ancient sages of Iran, thy star shall have no morn. The king of England must have had some such thoughts when the sun arose like a golden lamp to show him the disasters of the previous evening. His whole camp was devastated. The canvas of the tents hung in tatters, and all over that immense plain where the green grain had been trodden down by English cavalry, seven thousand horses lay dead beside their masters. There is no historical fact better attested than this extraordinary event. Edward was so awed by it that he was long before he recovered the shock, as he himself confessed to the continator of Nanges. Some time after, conformably to the promise which he had made, in his fright, to the powerful patroness of Chartres, he signed the peace concluded at Bretigny, a small town of Chartrician district, and his haughty nobles, laying aside their arrogance for the time, came as peaceful and humble pilgrims to kneel before the Virgin's shrine.